we find ourselves entering now into a very special yontiv, a very special festival, Shvishal Pesach, the seventh day of Passover. Many people would think that the climax of Passover would be right at the beginning when we have the when we have the Seder, and then it's all downhill from there. Even even from the biblical observances, the fact that we have the same sacrifice every day, as opposed to on Sukkot, there's different sacrifices for each day of Sukkot. The numbers are different. Passover each day is the same. The Musaf offerings, you would think the additional offering, which we read in the book of Numbers, chapter 28. But we see, not only from the Hasidic movement, but even earlier, we see from the, the special liturgy that we have for these days. Even though, as I mentioned, also because of that we don't say Shechianu in the last days of Pesach, as we do in the last days of Sukkot, we don't say the full Hallel, we only say the half Hallel. There is a kind of a minor key to these last days of Passover. However, our liturgy and, and the Hasidic traditions uh, bring this out as well, show that really there's tremendous holiness on the last day of Passover. A memory I personally have as a bacher in Yerushalayim, learning in Yeshiva, and spending Pesach in Yerushalayim, was I went to the Tish in Meisharim, Tulsar and Tulsar for Mitzchak, both, I, I, I happened to visit both, and a few other Tishin, I think, that night as well. It was a very special time, the night of the seventh of Pesach, seventh night of Pesach. Especially in, in the Hasidic communities, I remember I went to Slanim, I went to a few other, I think maybe Boyan, I stopped that night. Uh, this we're talking about, this would probably be 2001. <laughs> If I, if I recall right, so this was 16 years ago, maybe 2002 already by then, and I remember after the Tish, we went very late, and I'm walking home with the Toldos Aaron Rebbe's son, Rabbi Moshe Kohn, and Rabbi Kohn, he said to me, Yitzchak, Shvishel Paisach is the Yontif in the Minna. So the seventh day of Passover is a holiday of faith. And the power of faith that we embrace on this very special night when we recall the crossing of the Red Sea. And all the things our sages talk about crossing of the Red Sea. And all the schoolers that are involved with the crossing of the Red Sea. Our sages say that many things are compared, are as difficult as crossing the Red Sea. And yet, and, and which would seem to say that things that we take for granted in life, our families, our livelihoods, in reality are just as great miracles and may, maybe even greater than crossing the Red Sea. And when we embrace that message, then those people who are in need of things people looking to start families, people looking to have a livelihood or have difficulties in these things. When we recall the great miracle that happened by the crossing of the Red Sea, that helps us to embrace these things and to grow in these things. And Tanya brings a very interesting idea. He uses the crossing of the Red Sea as a marshal, as a parable, as a demonstration really of all of creation in a way. How's that? We know that the basic physics, science, is the difference between a solid and a liquid, even though now, you know, we deal with potato starch for Pesach and we mix it with water and we have these non-Newtonian fluids that we can make mixing the potato starch and water and all kinds of interesting things there, but the basic physics we know there's on earth we have you know solids and liquids and gases and stars there plasma and other things but basically we're familiar 
with solids and liquids and gases. And a solid maintains its own shape. It doesn't, you know, automatically one solid piece doesn't take the form of its container as opposed to a liquid. The nature of liquid is to take the form of, of its container. Now, a strong wind can create such a thing of a effect like splitting the sea. A very strong wind. And the Torah mentions a strong wind. The Midrashim describe it in much more fantastic lengths of how there were 12 different um, 12 different roads for each for each of the 12 tribes and how the, the, the roads were paved with sapphire stones and beautiful things but the Torah tells us that they went on dry land which itself was quite miraculous that they didn't go in mud but putting Midrashim aside Tanya says, look at this. The Torah tells us that there was a great east wind, Ruach Kodim, that came and caused the sea to split and caused it to be two walls to their right and to their left. A wall as they split, as they went to the sea. So, therefore, energy was working on the sea to make the, this wall temporarily. As long as the energy was there, working on it, the sea split and made two walls. But after the wind was taken away, the energy was taken away. The liquid reverted to its natural state and drowned our oppressors. That being said, we see therefore that the the nature of water is to fill its container, the nature of a liquid, and only by virtue of a special energy was it maintained temporarily as we saw. Now, a basic idea in Judaism is that God created the world, yesh ma'ayin, like they say in Latin, ex nihilo, something from nothing. Now, the Tanya says, all the more so, the nature of nothing is to be nothing. And so there has to be a constant creative force to maintain the existence of the world. And if for one split second, God would remove his creative force, the world would revert to nothing. Meaning, Creation is not just something that happened 5,700 years ago. And then God just left it to exist and nature is taking its course. If just basic logic dictates that if God created the world something from nothing, so it required a creative force Kind of like how Einstein spoke of matter being an expression of energy. That it's a matter, but energy equals matter it's times matter. the speed of light squared e equals mc squared. Well, you need to be stuck. Just sit in your seat. Just stay in your seatbelt. The existence of matter and really the existence no. of all energy and everything that we We're see in creation. You can get out of your seat, okay? is a manifestation of God's constant energy being fed into the creation and that God has to constantly be creating the universe and if for one moment he withdrew his creative force even more so than how gravity would take its toll and revert a liquid to its natural uh, state of filling its container as was by the Red Sea it's even more so that nothing would revert back to nothingness if not for the constant investiture of energy that God constantly puts into our whole existence. Not just that we're alive and not dead, but that our very molecules, our very atoms exist. Our very, even the energy itself exists 
is it constantly being exerted by the force of God. Now this could answer a question that science asks, where does the energy come from in the atom? Electrons are zooming around the atoms constantly at a very high rate of speed. How is that? What, what causes that? That's the creative energy that God puts into the world that's supernatural that makes it possible for us to exist. And so the splitting of the Red Sea reminds us of all of these things. And so therefore, like it says, that Kosha is a Vugri Shaladam, Kosha is a nice of Shaladam, Kukriya's a Yam. That it's difficult to start a family just like crossing the, the splitting the sea. It's difficult to make a living like splitting the sea. We, when we recognize that for God, nothing is difficult. It takes energy and effort, but ultimately God is in control of everything. And when we're cognizant of that, there it becomes a supernatural force in our lives. I read from Ritzvi Meir Zilberberg today, someone translated um, what I saw online. It says, Hayom Ravi Anais. It says in the Psalms, the sea saw and fled. What did the sea see? Asks our sages in the Medrash. Ra'aroina Shal Yosef. They saw the coffin, the sepulchre of Yosef at Sadiq, of the saintly Joseph, the son of Jacob. And by virtue and merit of the bones of Joseph did the sea split. Now before I get to what Rev. Mayer says, I remember I was by the Tish of the Ulmerov, Shlita in Queens, and he mentioned Parshas B'Shalach, that when it says that the sea saw the, the, the Ark of Joseph, the, the uh, sepulchre of Joseph, what it means is that it says, Alzois is Paul Kol Chasid Eleich Eleis Mitzoi, she is Shait of Maim Rabbi Meilov. That Eleis Mitzoi, it says in the Psalms, every saintly, pious individual prays for the time of finding, lest abundant waters come upon him and drown him. It says in Psalm 32. What does that mean? It, it, so he says that the Talmud tells us that even though the four forms of capital punishment are not practiced anymore by the great Sanhedrin, they still exist. God still meets out the same punishments. And so let's say someone was liable to strangulation. That's the punishment for Ashes Ish. And there's no Sanhedrin today, the person might drown and suffer strangulation the same way that someone would be strangled, hanged, uh, with the strangulation was usually by two um, handkerchiefs in opposite directions pulled. Um, it, it would fulfill the same thing. And so as he says, Al every pious person prays, Lais Matsoy and says Matsa Isha Matsutoyev says in the Proverbs, when a man finds a wife, he finds goodness, that he prays to to, to get married, so he could be saved from the sin of Ashes Ish. And this way the abundant waters won't come upon him that he won't be drowned. And so Yosef at Sadik, who overcame the Nisoyan, the temptation of an Ashes Ish by Ashes Potiphar, he was uh, by virtue of his bones, the sea split because it was uh, his supernatural o overcoming of that temptation saved all of the people from drowning. Even, uh, even vicariously, even if they didn't have the same schools that he had, which they probably also did, but not the same level because they didn't have the Nisyonis that he had, still, it was by virtue of the, the Ark, the sepulchre of Yosef at Tzaddik, that the sea split. Now, Yosef at Tzaddik, 
I, so that's what I heard from the, the woman of Shlita. So I, I saw today from Sigmar Zilberberg, Yosef Atzalik was, he was sure that he had failed in that mission for many reasons. But, the, but despite the fact that he felt that he failed for whatever reason, we don't have to get into right now, he still got up and fought, and that's, and he, he didn't, and, he, and the angels told him that everything was lost. He's, he's no longer Yosef Atzadik. He no longer, he was supposed to have ten tribes descend from him, and he only had two. And all, everything was lost. But, and he said, and they said, look, your brothers, they were right to try to execute you, and all these things. But still, he said, I don't care. It's like the story of the Baal Shem Tov. He's, they told him once, you lost your share in the world to come. He said, I don't care. I just want to serve God. I don't care about whether I get a reward from it. And because of that, because he overcame that, Yosef at Sadiq became Yosef at Sadiq. So that's the Koyach of Yosef at Sadiq. Now, in the Sphira, each day of the Sphira, we, uh, we're going to count, today is five days of, this, of the Omer, we're going to count uh, tonight six days. Six, each day corresponds to different aspect of the Holy Spheres. And so the seventh day of Pesach is Yisoy Shebechesed, which is the Indian of Yosef at Tzadik. And so it goes very well with everything that we said. That's one crescendo that we have within the uh, the Pesach, but in Golis we're zoyche. Hashem put us into Golis for a good reason. We're zoyche to have an eighth day of Pesach. On the eighth day of Pesach, we read the prophecy from Isaiah about the coming of the Messiah. And so the Indian of Mashiach, the concept of the coming of the Messiah, is a major theme in the eighth day of Pesach. And that is also apropos because then we have Malchus Shebechesed. And Malchus is the Indian of Mashiach. Melech HaMashiach. Dovod HaMelech. And so in this way, we come to that higher level that's Lamal Mader HaTeva, that's supernatural. And so therefore, also we have by the Hasidim that we don't eat the Gebrax the whole week. We now have this excitement of eating Gebrax on the eighth day of Pesach. And the Koyach of that is in many things. One thing is to say that there's unity through all our people on the eighth day of Pesach. It's Mashiach Tzaitin. And so there's the Indian of, of Achdus, but also there's the Indian of Malchus Pesh, Tershabal Peh, Krinenbach. And the power of Tershabal Peh is also the power uh, the, of the Oral Torah is the power of the Rabbis. And the tremendous power that is there with the um, with, with the, the eighth day of Pesach, it's not that we're being lenient because it's the Rabbanan, as many people would think, but it's just the opposite. That the power of the rabbis is so much that it protects us from any mashu chomets, that we don't have to worry that we're we nechshol and eating chomets. And so that's the koyach, that's a tremendous energy that the, the chazal, that our sages of the Talmud put into our lives. That by having things that go beyond what the Torah expects, through that power protects us, not only that it's a protection in the sense, in a natural sense, that we're protected from sin by having a fence around the Torah, but also there's a supernatural energy that is placed in there that protects us from sin. And so in that schus we should be zoicha to realize all the tremendous koiches of Shvishal Pesach and Achron Shal Pesach, that these are a tremendous crescendo and climax to Pesach. And we should enjoy that and be inspired by that. If you happen to be in Sullivan County, you're welcome to join us at our synagogue. We'll have services that 
Monday and Tuesday at 9.30. Tuesday we'll have Yisker service also. It's very popular. Everybody's welcome to come in Kanyanga Lake, Lake Street. And uh, uh, we have a very special rabbi, Rabbi Fishbang. We've seen his videos also on this channel. Uh, and more than that, everyone's welcome to like, share, and subscribe. And we look forward uh, to greeting, uh, seeing everyone together when Mashiach comes. Thank you very much. God bless and good yantiv.